Ludi becomes emperor reluctantly and rules for three years, but his reign faces uncertainty. His family's demise caused conflicts and made him the next emperor. He is upset by the royal family treating him as a political amateur, like a puppet. But with his servants and magic, he achieved victory by winning battles. However, an impending uprising is afoot. His constituents rally and accuse him of corruption. He suspects that nobles have spread rumors about him. Ludi yearned for his title to command respect. Support overflows from his loyal beast servants. They find humans inferior for going against their emperor. Silently, he takes pride in his nickname, the Demon King's Bastard. Due to his emperor mark, he can conquer humans, dragons, and sacred creatures, but his ability is only for magic beast subjugation. Fearing his ability, the Imperial family locked him in the academy. To his advantage, his skills increased the more he used his magic at the academy. Despite his rise to power, his infamy never faded. Ludi silences his loyal servants. Their disobedience prompted him to call them into his presence. Astonishment soaked the servants' faces. Rune, the slime, asserts their loyalty to defend their actions but Ludi commands them to escape into the mountains. However, objections arise from his loyal servants. Disappointed, Ludi explains the possible war should they retaliate, ruining what he built. Silence falls upon his loyal servants. Against his will, he is forced to compel them into submission. Ludi casts his spell using his name. His servants flinch but turn puzzled. Ludi is astonished as he forgets his original name. Naively, Rune finishes his majesty's words and calls him foolish. Pissed off, the servants are annoyed by the slime's interruption. Ludi is sentimental about his servants. He then proceeds to cast his spell with his full name. His loyal servants express their reluctance as they succumb to his majesty's magic. Ludi compels them to escape and ends their master-servant bond. Instantly, the hallway empties. Tears fall while Ludi shows his remorse. The emperor did the best for his servants. Afterwards, the angry people confront the demon king's bastard. Nonchalantly, Ludi faces their rage while threatening to rob his empire. The angry man begs Ludi to bring his lover back. The emperor clarifies. Anguishly, he blames the empire for losing his lover to magic beasts caused by war. The tragedy happened during Ludi's elder brother's reign. Nonchalantly, he takes full accountability for their sufferings. The grieving man continues to display his agony. Ludi offers his life for compensation. Directly, he asks them to kill him. The man falls silent as he raises his knife, causing blood to splatter. Louis falls to his death as he recounts his dull life. After being caged in the academy, he unwillingly became an emperor and went to countless wars. But he truly enjoyed learning magic with his loyal beast servants. His soulless eyes display. While gazing at his bloody hand, he wonders about an afterlife where he can be free. Meanwhile, a lake house stands peacefully in the daylight. A foreign language echoes while he rouses a married couple. Louis's baby form displays an indication of his reincarnation. As a young boy, Ludi still couldn't believe his reincarnation. His name is the same, but unlike his past life, he was born into a peasant family. He notes that Ludi is a common name in their village. Admittedly, there are many things he can't grasp yet. His friend calls him while he remains foreign to the language and place. The isolated village is surrounded by fields and mountains, with merchants as frequent visitors. Ludi always feels strange about his surroundings. An urgent report arrives about their village chief passing out. The people gather to check on their chief's bedridden state. Ludi checks his condition using his magic. While diagnosing his body, he finds out he only has a cold. Ludi is puzzled as to why nobody uses magic to heal the chief. Unable to turn a blind eye, he volunteers to help. Ludi instantly uses his magic to heal the chief. The bedridden man feels better, while the crowd is astonished. Ludi sighs in relief, confident that the chief's fever will go down. The villagers are surprised that Ludi can use magic. Suddenly, he realizes what has bothered him since he was reincarnated. It is a fact that the villagers can't use magic. While doing simple labor, he did not see them use magic. He suspects their illiteracy with ancient texts hinders them from using magic. Instantly, he becomes a celebrity in his peers' eyes, making him uncomfortable. With this, he regained his magic instinct by accepting patience and teaching his peers to use healing magic. At night, Ludi practices the magic he can remember from his past life but he remained cautious as his magic sank to a normal level. If only his servants are around, magic power will not be a problem for him. Despite his challenges, he remains positive about his magical growth. He is more bothered by the villagers' inability to use magic. Questions echo in his head about the village and the time since he died. Ludi pauses momentarily. Meanwhile, the chief thanks him for his help. Until Ludi expresses his desire to leave the village, the chief listens while Ludi notes the village peacefulness. However, his curiosity about the world and desire for freedom are stronger. He chooses to move freely in this lifetime, unlike in his past life. 
His seriousness is displayed in his eyes. However, as a peasant, there are two ways for him to leave. The first is to work as a soldier under a lord. The second is to become an adventurer. Ludi's eyes show interest in the second option. Adventurers, like mercenaries, work for the lord or kingdom and fight magic beasts. Traveling around the world is required to be an adventurer. The village chief warns him of the job's dangerous nature. With happiness in his eyes, Louis declares his desire to be an adventurer. The chief pauses momentarily to show his support. He prepares his application form. Days later, Ludi informed his parents of his plans. They objected at first since the job was dangerous, but he eventually convinced them after several tries. After the maturity ceremony, his family and the villagers saw him off. They gave him their best wishes as he embarked on his adventurous journey. He promises to earn money to lift them out of poverty. While carrying his tiny bag, he bids farewell to the villagers. Ludi moves forward as he chases his freedom. His presence transcends through a cave as the slime recognizes his master. Ludi travels to Urban City to become an adventurer. To be recognized as one, he needs to pass an exam. Adventurers gather inside the guild. They seem to use magic, and their weapons remind him of his empire. The quest board's posts are in a foreign language. The clerk clarifies his registration. His commoner background is introduced. To pass the test, Ludi needs to bring back a magic beast's body part or item. He clarifies the requirement, finding it strangely easy. Ludi then looks at his empty pocket. His search for a magic beast happens in the forest. In his past life, humans and magic beasts' relationships were the same. Both creatures despise each other, causing an endless conflict. Despite killing magic beasts when needed, he found most of them harmless. If only his servants were with him, he could track the entire forest easier. Something suddenly captures his vision. He senses a weak magical presence, indicating a small magical beast inside a cave. Ludi enters the cave. His magic lights up the dark surroundings. He walks around until something stops him. A scared voice asks what a human like him wants. Ludi sees blue slime trembling in fear, thanks to his detection skill. Ludi negotiates with the slime, who can understand human language. Suddenly, something strikes his attention about the slime. Ludi clarifies why the magic beast knows the Empire's language. Rune, the slime, gets offended and brings up his majesty's name wrongly, but Ludi corrects him. Suddenly, a moan of realization hits Rune. The magic beast is puzzled that he knows his master's name. Ludi introduces his identity to Rune. The slime is bewildered. Ludi tries to recite his full name while racking his brain. Rune helps him with his name and notices his majesty's familiar expression. The magic beast is confused, knowing that his master is gone. Since Rune does not believe him, he uses his magic. With his skills, he plans to transfer his thoughts to Rune. The slime's confused face slowly turns to crying. Pairs of tears shed as the magic beast jumps into his master's arms. Ludi catches up and finds out he was reincarnated a thousand years after his death. When his servants escaped the empire, they failed to find common ground, causing their disbandment. Rune avoided humans, so it lived in the cave. Without external threats, Slime can live an immortal life. After many years, he realizes why he can't recognize anything. Ludi notes his servants' painful memories because of him, while the Slime confirms. The magic beast changes the topic of his exam. Rune offers part of his body to his majesty as it can recover fast. Ludi uses his magic to heal his servant. Warmth wraps around the Slime's body. Ludi prepares for his return to the guild to become an adventurer. Rune reluctantly calls his master. Ludi turns to witness his old servant begging to serve him once more. Ludi stops and reluctantly gathers his words. His abandonment of them in the past might happen again in this lifetime. Rune objects, noting that Ludi did not abandon them and understood his decision. The slime expresses his loyalty and insists on serving Ludi again. In his head, Ludi does not want to abandon Rune either. However, Ludi is no longer an emperor and his mark no longer exists. Suddenly, light appears before his eyes. His emperor's mark magically appears on his hand. Not only does he take his knowledge from his past life, but also from the emperor's mark. He wonders if this is compensation for his past life. He calms down and asks Rune if he is sure. In a heartbeat, the slime declares his loyalty to his master. Ludi reaches Rune. Officially, he takes the slime as his official servant once more. Rune pledges his loyalty to Ludi. Nostalgia envelopes Rune, seeing his young master's happy face. Ludi exits the cave and heads off to the guild. Rune gladly follows his master. However, he is wary about taking a magical beast back to the city. Suddenly, a feminine voice tries to remove his worries. Ludi's surprised face displays itself as he sees Cecile. But it is just Rune using his shape-shifting ability. Despite his short-term effect, Rune has perfected his skill after training for so long. 
Rune's skill is flawless, making him indistinguishable from the real person. While Rune's idea is good, Ludi awkwardly asks him why he chose Cecile. She was his classmate in his past life, belonging to a noble family with many suitors. Ludi had a crush on her, but it would be troublesome if Rune were to shapeshift into a living person. That said, Rune finds it safer to disguise himself as someone who is dead to avoid problems. Silently, Ludi still questions why Rune chose Cecile. Finally, they exit the cave, but Ludi asks Rune to stop addressing him with his old title. Rune is puzzled. Since he is only an adventurer now, he prefers to go by his first name. Rune obeys but still calls him Master. While walking, Ludi explains his decision to be an adventurer and travel the world. Additionally, he is hopeful to meet his old servants after many years, but he is worried that they will despise him after everything. Rune displays his loyalty and support for his past actions. Despite being grateful for what Rune said, it is not simple for him. Ludi stops at the view of a fallen carriage. An aggressive fight erupts between a beast and a human. The pitiful guards are outnumbered by ten goblins. Ludi can't ignore the situation. He decides to kill the goblins, astonishing Rune. Ludi plans to stop the unavoidable circumstance. Despite his desire to stay low-key, he just can't turn a blind eye. Ludi commands Rune to support his back. He analyzes the goblins and their weapons. The impending spear approaches the frightened guard's face, until a magic wall blocks the sharp weapon, saving the helpless guard. Ludi turns his attention to the goblins with bows. He whips the goblins with his magic thunder. Fear displays the goblins' faces. One tries to sneak attack, but Ludi's reflexes win. The goblin's boss is frightened. However, the beasts are persistent, leaving Ludi with no choice as he casts another spell. A ball of fire emerges, burning his opponents. The goblins are pissed off and retreat immediately. Astonishment fills Ludi's face upon hearing the Empire's language from the goblins. He decides to chase the magic beasts. Suddenly, the guards call him for help. Since he is a rookie adventurer, he attends to the guards instead. A royal girl lies unconscious on the ground, surprising Ludi. Worried guards surround her. Silently, Ludi suspects that her shallow wound was poisoned. Ludi offers to help her. After diagnosing her with magic, he confirms his suspicion. She is affected by a poison curse. The guards panic as the poison spreads fast. However, Ludi anticipates that she only has five minutes left. Carefully, he thinks of a solution. Even if their carriage is fixed, they will not make it to the city. Hopelessness rises to save the girl. Not unless he uses his advanced magic purification. The sage class skill applies to detoxification. He wants to avoid standing out, but he can't turn a blind eye. Ludi offers to provide her with temporary first aid so she will not die. Thanks to Rune's support, he has enough mana. Light emanates as Ludi uses his purification skill on the girl. Excitement fills the guards' faces, seeing their master regain consciousness, but they still need to take her to the city for maximum recovery. This way, Ludi avoids standing out even though she is almost healed. Ludi and Rune's exit is stopped by the guard. He expresses his gratitude, while Ludi tries to excuse himself. He turns their attention to the girl, suggesting her immediate return to the city. The guards take instant action. The girl rouses with confusion and recognizes the purification spell. Ludi followed them to the city and stealthily left. The poison has been treated, which continues her recovery. He can finally go to the guild. Suddenly, Rune arrives in a rush to greet Ludi. Rune retains Cecile's form to avoid getting attention as a slime. Suddenly, Rune kneels down and asks for orders from Ludi. He looks embarrassed as he reminds Rune of his commoner status. Since Rune takes on a human form, Ludi decides to register his servant too but he forgot the documents needed from the village chief. Rune carefully thinks about it and suggests creating the documents instead. Ludi is okay with the idea. He hands the requirements to the clerk and requests their registrations. The clerk looks at the documents while the two are anxious. She then checks the results. Ludi and Rune are safe after forging the documents using Rune's body. He recounts Rune's flawless ability, which he used for his schemes in the old days. Astonishment fills the clerk's face. Ludi explains that he can only defeat blue slimes, which are the weakest of their kind. The clerk is surprised to see it for the first time. Anxiousness displays Ludi's face, realizing that blue slimes are rare in the current era. He sweats while trying to make up an excuse. Silence echoes in the reception. The clerk naively believes in Ludi's lies. He released a big sigh of relief. The clerk hands them a couple of pins. With this, they are now official adventurers. In the afternoon, they attended a carrier orientation. He likes the idea of accessing different guilds across the world and freely crossing borders. Duties involve monster exterminations that are not hard. Adventurers are classified as warriors, hunters, or mages based on the guild's criteria. Ludi and Rune will participate in an aptitude test soon to identify their class. 
Ludi rests after a tiring day. Rune's light footsteps approach Ludi and give him a hug. Still in one form, Rune gladly offers Ludi to alleviate his stress. Civilians remind them to keep quiet. Rune is startled. Back in his slimy form, Rune feels bad for being impolite. Silently, Ludi thinks he was a bit too hard on him, but he empathizes with Rune, who has been around for eternity. He approaches the sad Rune. Ludi comforts his servant. Rune's sadness gives way to happiness. About the upcoming aptitude test, he reminds Rune to only use basic magic to avoid standing out. Silently, he realizes that he should worry about himself instead. After reincarnating, he found it hard to adjust his magic strength. Being in a war would be easier because he would not need to hold back. He needs to also use basic magic to avoid standing out. Given his limitations, Rune chooses to be a warrior as his class. Ludi offers to buy Rune armor and a weapon. Ludi's face emanates happiness as he talks to Rune excitedly. Ludi enjoys making his own decisions in this lifetime. He holds hands with his servant. Together, as adventurers, they plan to challenge new things. Rune is pleased to be with his master. Ludi plans to set up a base and expand his area of operations eventually. With this, he can possibly meet his other servants. While together outside, an inquiring voice clarifies Ludi and Rune's identity. Nor introduces herself to the person assigned for their aptitude test. Her class is mage, and she politely greets them. Nor congratulates them for becoming adventurers and starts the test. She asks Ludi to come first. She clarifies his desired class as a magician. He confirms while carefully noting that he can use a little magic. A rookie adventurer who can use high-tier magic will be noticeable. He plans to use basic magic and restrain his powers. The test's first round is about healing magic. She naughtily asks if he can replenish her magic power using regeneration. With such a basic skill, he confirms that he cannot do it. Instantly, he casts the spell. Nor is he astonished. Without incantation, Ludi casts the spell. Anxiously, he denies knowing about incantation, given his humble upbringing. He continues to make up an excuse. Nor explains that magicians of the former empire used to cast magic without incantations. She thinks Ludi is one of their descendants. Unintentionally, Ludi shows more than he should. He then asks for the next round of the exam. After pausing, she asks him to show his offensive skills. This time, Ludi plans to be more careful. He decides to use a fireball and aims to hit the target. With a basic spell, Ludi further adjusts his magical strength. He shoots a fireball with precision. Nor is impressed, and he extinguishes the fire. She releases an aquatic shot at the burning target. Nor has a general grasp of his power. Suddenly, she notices that the fire is still up, leaving Nor astonished. She tries to use her aquatic skills once more. However, the fire remains. Anxiously, Ludi realizes that his fireball is an upgraded version for military use. Nor's anxiety intensifies. She asks Ludi and Room to call for help. But with his improved fireball, it will only be futile. It will be difficult for them to find a capable magician to put down his fireball. Ludi decides to interfere. Nor does it turn even more serious. She uses her aquatic shot for the third time. Behind the scenes, Ludi gives her magical support discreetly. The upgraded aquatic shot envelopes the burning target. Finally, the fire is put out. Nor and Ludi release a big sigh of relief. Ludi is apologetic for the incident, but Nor is fine with it. While taking down notes, Nor assesses his ability. At first, she gives her apprentice the title of magician, but changes her mind and increases his rank to magician instead. Ludi is thankful. He is relieved that his exam went smoothly. Now, it is Rune's turn. Learning from his exam, Rune uses incantation and weakens her magical strength. As a result, she registers as an apprentice warrior, equipped with secondhand armor and swords. The next day, Ludi and Rune begin their lives as adventurers. The quest board is only filled with goblin skirmishes. Ludi and Rune can't find other quests. He recounts the princess that he saved from goblins recently, noting the beast's numbers. A welcoming voice greets Ludi. Eris, a hunter, introduces herself. Ludi does the same in return. She gazes at him sternly. Eris expresses her curiosity about Ludi, who was immediately promoted to magician, but she senses no negative aura from him. Although he was irritated, Ludi feels proud of his decent job to conceal his power. Eris notes her startled look about the quest. She reads his mind about the number of goblins and their hideouts. Goblins normally ambush cities and hide deep in the forest. Given the danger they bring, Ludi understands the multiple questions about goblins, but only if the authority pays more will many adventurers accept the quests and complete them. Ludi listens silently. Nobody accepts the quests due to the small bounties, where they only pay one dell or a pint of beer. One goblin slain is equal to one dell, which is challenging against a horde, making the quest futile. 
but they are rookies, so they can't be picky with their quest. Besides, Ludi had a premonition when he heard the goblins speaking his empire's language, so he wants to find out more. Hence, their first mission is to deal with goblins. Ludi and Rune head to the northern forest for their first mission. Rune hums while she calls her master's attention. She asks if the armor fits her, displaying a charming face. Awkwardly, he responds that it is just an iron chest plate and there is nothing much to expect from it. Rune's armor is a second-hand military item. For a second, Ludi sees Cecile, who looks noble and prestigious with her second-hand armor. Rune naughtily asks in what he is thinking. Embarrassed, he confused Rune's camouflage with the real Cecile. Ludi then asks Rune if she has any idea about the Gotland speaking his empire's language, but Rune finds it common and doubts that they are descendants. If only the beasts are reasonable like his old goblin servants, he can simply ask them to lead the city. But they need to resort to violence since goblins view humans as food. Ludi suddenly senses their presence. The goblins see Ludi and Rune's arrival. The beast finds them weak and can't wait to eat the adventurers. Calmly, Ludi looks for their leader to negotiate. But the goblin attacks him instantly. Ludi expects the beast's violent response. Urgent footsteps run forward as Rune protects her master. The goblin is astonished as Rune slashes the enemies. Annoyance rises from the magical beasts, but Ludi joins the battle by shocking them with his thunder magic. Accidentally, he kills one of the goblins. Ludi looks at them ominously, asking for their ears. Rune coldly kills the goblin for showing disrespect to her master. Ominously, she warns the beasts about not laying a hand on Ludi. Goblins remain violently the same, unless he speaks to the leader to negotiate. Ludi praises Rune's ability. Soaked in blood, she feels delighted by her master's compliment. Ludi feels strange about Rune's scary vibe, who is still a slime. The goblin can't believe losing to a human. The dying beast fights to breathe. Soaked in blood, he asks for forgiveness from his master, named Bates. Ludi and Rune are astonished to hear the name. Back in the guild, the two present a bag to the receptionist. Ludi and Rune collected goblins' ears as proof of their quest. The clerk checks the bag, but she is surprised to see 50 goblin ears. He defeated 50 more, but did not have any information except for a name. He recounts their leader's name, Bates. He was Ludi's servant, with an interest in researching magic. Since humans and goblins' lifespans are the same, there is no way Bates is still alive. Unless magic exists that extends a creature's lifespan knowing Bates, he hates conflicts between humans and goblins. Perhaps they only share the same name. Eris surprises them with praise for doing a good job. She is impressed by Ludi and Rune's performance as newbies. She asks for some tips for defeating 50 goblins. Suddenly, Ludi grabs the crowd's attention. He simply says that Rune helped him. Eris can only defeat three goblins compared to his hunt. While the crowd gathers, his anxiety displays with the intensity of his hunt. Suddenly, he likens the quest to boar hunting, explaining that they trap the goblins first, then kill them. Eris is suspicious, knowing that goblins are not dumb. He adds that Rune acted as bait. Suddenly, an agreeable voice interrupts them. Castle taunts Eris if she can't devise such a plan as a hunter. Eris expresses her annoyance. Castle boasts about his early beginnings when his goblin hunting skills were praised. The crowd laughs as Eris reveals that Castle returned weeping for failing to hunt a goblin. Ludi notices how everyone gets along with others. Eris sets their argument aside. The adventurers feasted to celebrate the newbie's first successful mission. As a rule, seniors will pay for the newcomer's meal, so Eris asks them to order anything. Ludi feels shy. Suddenly, a pair of hands grab Rune's figure. Eris encourages them to eat a lot to grow. Ludic feels awkward, asking Rune why she is not reacting. While Ludi looks at his food, Eris welcomes him to the ranks of adventurers. For the first time, Ludi can choose his own food. Eris tells him to eat without using any cutlery. Ludi looks reluctant at first, but finds his first bite delightful. The adventurers gather happily over dinner. On this day, Ludi eats his favorite food and witnesses smiles from his new peers, which excites him. After drinking too much, Rune carries Ludi in a drunken state as they leave the feast. After their first mission, Eris and Castle join Ludi and Rune to haunt goblins. Eris urgently cautions Castle against their enemies. The goblin violently falls to his demise. While Castle celebrates, another goblin sneaks up behind him. Ludi urgently wards him. The goblin attacks Castle's defenseless back. Things happen in a flash. Until help arrives with magic, Nor casts a fireball, immediately burning the goblin. The examiner looks effortless. Silently, Ludi joins the quest, not because of the reward. Instead, he joins for an aptitude test bearing witness to Nor's magic. Nor has reached Ori Halcom, which is the highest adventurer's rank. He observes Nor's magic to understand more about the current era. With this, he realizes that the standard of this era 
has lowered significantly. His seniors can't use detection magic, while Nor can't even use middle tier magic. A single middle tier spell could easily wipe out five goblins. Arist interrupts Ludi's thoughts while he gazes at Nor. He explains that he thought she was cool. She suspects the reason why he became a magician puzzling Ludi. Eris and Castle leave Ludi and Nor alone in the market. Eris misunderstands the situation and thinks Ludi has a thing for Nor. Ludi acts normally and asks Nor to move on. While walking, he carefully thinks about what to ask him. Ludi pauses momentarily as he sees a statue. His figure riding a horse erects a symbol of his bravery. Puzzled by his view, Nor tells him it is Ludi's statue of the former emperor. Astonishment fills his face. Nor thinks he might become like the late emperor in the future. Silently, he notes that he shares the same name as the emperor. Nor does he note the last emperor's lengthy name. Thoughts run through Ludi's head about the late emperor. While gazing at the statue, he realizes it is him. Nor mentions the emperor's rank in line, confirming to Ludi that it is him. She notes the last emperor's greatness during his reign. With this, he gains the title of Holy Emperor. He feels strange while looking at his statue. Nor says that his statue symbolizes their respect for him. She reveals that the person who built the statue's model was his own killer. Ludi is at a loss for words. The man despised the Holy Emperor for not protecting his homeland. But after Ludi's death, only then did the people understand his rightful policy. He feels vindicated after hearing Moore's revelation. The Holy Emperor even became a god, surprising Ludi. Calamities and conflicts befell the country after his death, so people prayed for his return. Ludi comes to realize that humans only wish for restoration after all. Following Nor's narrative, she believes that Ludi's return is impossible. Her hopeful eyes gleam, imagining an evil free world under the Holy Emperor's reign. Silently, he notes that if he were resurrected, he would not be emperor. In the inn, Ludi returns and is greeted by Rune. With their combined incomes, they rented a long-term inn and summoned smaller slimes from the cave. While Ludi was away, the smaller smiles mastered basic knowledge, including different languages. They even learned how to camouflage a human for a day. Ludi's strength was boosted since they became his servants. The slime's camouflage proficiency also improved. Ludi just needs to think of what he wants the slime to camouflage into. He chooses personalities from his past life to be safe. Carefully, he thinks until selling comes to his mind. She was his classmate whom he had a crush on. Ludi is suddenly flustered. The slime transforms into his classmate. Ludi is still surprised, while the slime in selling's form gladly greets him. Rune expected no less. He informs his master that the smaller slimes do not have a name yet. Rune suggests Selene, but Ludi objects. He comes up with the name Marina, a beautiful girl with blue hair like crystal clear waters. Rune sees through Ludi, but he wonders why his servant is interested in affection. Rune tells Marina to show her respect to Ludi. She obeys by expressing her gratitude for Ludi. He feels awkward as he wishes her good luck. Rune gives Ludi a naughty look. The slime does the same for the others, but its accuracy might be compromised. Suddenly, Eris arrives, asking for Ludi and Rune's presence at the guild. Ludi immediately agrees. Eris finds Rune's appearance strange, without knowing it was a different creature. Adventurers gather at the guild. An urgent voice commands silence. The Duke's orders are about to be announced. An army of goblins marches toward the city. Silently, Ludi notes the move that the goblins have taken. The adventurer commands an ambush and plans a preemptive strike. He asks the adventurers to join the front line. The strategy does not make sense for Ludi. Anxiousness rises as he tries to grasp the Duke's plans. They prepare for a preemptive strike outside the city, while adventurers defend the wall. The adventurers discuss, while Ludi silently notes their overconfidence about their strategy. A war erupts between goblins and humans. Ludi observes a thousand goblins around 600 soldiers. He asks Rune for her opinion. The goblins' force remains stable while their army is disrupted. They worry about the situation worsening. The army underestimates the goblins, so they keep advancing. It is challenging to counter pincer attacks with the army's disrupted formation. Something strikes Ludi's attention. Prince Urena commands the army in the field. Suddenly, Ludi recognizes her. Urena's alert face displays. The goblins mimic the empire's formation. Ludi pauses. While Urena catches on to the goblin's strategy to attack directly and wreak havoc silently, Ludi confirms the Empire's formation. A commanding voice asks for the army's leader. The guards panic as Urena demands answers. They reveal that he is in a brothel, surprising Urena. She clenches her teeth. She commands them to come after their leader. Silently, Ludi finds the leader's behavior daring. Ludi's back displays his dark hair. He has a distressed look. While Yuri gazes at the familiar figure, her charming face displays. Despite being a princess, 
Yurina is a force to be reckoned with. Eris appears out of nowhere as she introduces the princess. Yurina is the 17th princess of the kingdom. Eris asks Ludi to focus and looks for Rune. Suddenly, the battle begins. The army fights fiercely against the goblins. The adventurer celebrates soon seeing the goblin's formation collapsing. Ludi wonders if his projection of the outcome is wrong. Anxiousness displays in his eyes. He recalls the dying goblin mentioning Bates's name. He thinks that the goblin's leader is not the Bates that he knew. Suddenly, an ominous wind blows. A violent tornado whirls on the battlefield, sucking the army inside. Bewilderment displays Ludi's eyes. The tornado continues to spin. Fear displays the wounded army's faces. The tornado cuts through anything it touches. Screams of agony echo the battlefield. The adventurers are puzzled, thinking it is magic. Hope falls to the ground. Nor's knees weaken as she anticipates their end. Eris checks on her. Her frightened face confirms that they are witnessing a legendary firestorm spell. Against this magic, no number of soldiers stands a chance. Ludi remains silent. Firestorm is a high-tier magic that few people from a thousand years ago can use. In a devolved magic world presently is a terrifying scene. He suspects a goblin wizard capable of high-tier magic on the enemy's side. Ludi intervenes in the chaotic atmosphere. He casts a tranquility spell to calm down Nor. She falls into Eris' arms. Ludi puts her to sleep to avoid causing hysteria. He orders Rune to summon the other slimes. Ludi prepares to enter the battle. The army feels so hot, like they are burning. Goblins dominate the weakened soldiers. Agonizing screams resound on the battlefield. Suddenly, a force cuts the goblin's face. The soldier is puzzled. While seeing footprints on the ground, Ludi sees the situation while wearing an invisible cloak. The front line had fallen, and he couldn't save them all. The only option is to attack their base to disrupt the enemy. Spells like concealment hide noise and magic, while invisibility hides presence. The former consumes a lot of energy, so Rune and the other slimes disguise themselves as robes to use invisibility. With this, they can reach the enemy's base, but their energy is gradually depleting. Anxiously, he mentions Bates' name. He recounts their friendship in his past life. Ludi is certain his old servant is behind the attacks, and he plans to negotiate with him. A robed goblin stands among other goblins in their camp. Ludi removes his robe, causing surprise among his enemies. Ludi is also surprised to see the robe he gave away in his past life. He confronts Bates and asks if he knows him. Ludi sets his agenda for his arrival, while Bates is at a loss for words. Ludi introduces himself as the Emperor Bates once served. He tries to refresh the goblin's memory. Disbelief resounds in the camp. The goblins attack Ludi. As expected, Bates did not believe him easily. Ludi gathers magic energy. His thunderbolt strikes the goblins violently. Fear rises in the goblins' camp. The ground broke after the thunderous strike. The robed goblin is at a loss for words. Bewilderment fills his face, but the goblins do not know thunderbolt skills. Ludi realizes he is not Bates, but the goblin confirms his identity as the 18th of his name. His angry face clarifies his ancestor's relationship with the Emperor. Silently, he realizes that the goblins are his servant's descendants, and their leader inherited the Bates title. Ludi mentions the firestorm that the goblin learned from his predecessor. Bates, the 18th, displays his bewildered face. He recounts his old servant wanting to learn high-tier magic. Bates politely consulted him, while Ludi noted that a firestorm is the simplest form. Bates was ambitious, given that he was in the middle tier. But Ludi encouraged him that practice makes perfect. Although Bates did not see himself achieve success, he still hopes that, in a thousand years' time, his research will benefit the future. That is Bates' dream. A nostalgic laugh resounds in the Gotland's camp. Rune checks on his master. Like a madman, Ludi comes to his senses. Tears fall on his face as he sees Bates' dream come true. Ludi was right to believe in Bates. The goblin looks anxious and threatens Ludi with more high-tier magic. Calmly, Ludi calls Bates the 18th. Since his mood is good, he presents him with an offer. He asks him to become his servant. Bewilderment displays the goblin's face. In return for stopping the war, Ludi promises to teach the goblin everything he knows. While resembling his old servant, Ludi desires to reach greater heights with him. The goblin shakes intensely. Angrily, he tells Ludi to stop joking. He will make Ludi bow before him and call for his demise. The goblin conjures up a firestorm. Ludi is disappointed by his decision. Ludi reflects the goblin's magic back at him. Astonishment displays Bates' face. Panic strikes him as the firestorm approaches him. His body slowly perishes while he screams in agony. Clueless about magic reflection, the goblin was nowhere near his servant Bates. Ludi extends his regard to his servant through his descendant. Ludi declares that he is back. Anxiousness displays Rune's face. Ludi puts out the burning camp. Light emanates as he casts a spell. 
the royal guards assess the situation. Nor wakes up still worried about dealing with high-tier magic. Suddenly, Princess Yurina notices something. While Eris asks Nor to look at the sky, hope fills the adventurers' faces. Rain pours from the sky, putting out the fire. Nor suspects it is a high-tier magic aquatic splash. The guards look hopeful. So is Nor while noting the Holy Emperor's return. Ludi plans his return to the guild. He notes that it is rare for goblins to bow to humans like his old servant Bates. For the longest time, humans and goblins hated each other. He notes that nothing changes at all, but he is proven wrong as a goblin survives and pledges his service to Ludi. Luz bows to him and desires to learn magic from Ludi. Silently, he thinks that he is wrong after all. After defeating Bates, the goblin formation fell apart. Ludi took Luz as his servant and made him invisible as he returned to Elpen. Afterwards, the adventurers celebrate their victory. Ludi could not count the beer he drank. Castle tells him to drink as much as he wants today. They share a laugh until Eris grabs Castle to talk. Eris notes that Ludi and Rune's orders will be paid by Castle. While the two argue, Ludi asks for Nor from Eris. Nor is he at the square looking at the Holy Emperor's statue. Eris thinks she is still stunned after seeing the enemy's magic. Castle wonders if her reaction is true, but Nor could be bothered by something else. Eris clarifies, but only annoys her when Castle can't explain himself. Silently, Ludi thinks that something terrible reminded Nor. Eris wonders about the disappearance of the goblin's magic without a trace. Eris and Castle speculate, while Ludi panics behind. A naughty voice interrupts as Rune offers to help them understand. Rune is drunk as she reveals what happened while Ludi stops her. He escorts her in a drunken state outside the gathering. At the inn, Rune rests calmly. Marina asks his master to rest and offers him a fresh towel. She feels sorry about Bates's incident, but his focus now is on Luz, who is convincing other goblins to serve him. However, new issues arise about the accommodations. As his servants grow, Ludi needs a bigger place to live. Since goblins can't live with humans, he is looking for a remote place. But Marina insists that he rest after an exhausting day. She offers to look after Rune. He sleeps next to Rune, thinking that the camouflage wears off in the morning. Upon sleeping, he awakens to a pressured chest and a feeling of warmth and softness. Suddenly, Ludi and Rune sleep intimately close together, undressed. He is startled and looks for his clothes. But Rune hugs him innocently for warmth. Rune gets dangerously close to Ludi. Suddenly, a violent knock slams on their door. Instantly, Ludi gets dressed. He is greeted by menacing royal guards. They ask Ludi to come with them. Silently, he speculates on their agenda. He asks the guards again. Violently, they grab Ludi, calling him an imbecile farmer. Rune is alarmed for his master. Rune displays her enraged face. The guard is startled by her attack. Ludi stops her. He calms her down while claiming his innocence. Bewilderment fills Rune's face. Ludi promises not to give Rune up. Finally, she calms down. He decides to follow them since he can get away easily anyway. They arrive at a massive palace. Ludi is astonished. An apologetic voice greets him, noting that the princess will be delighted by Ludi's presence. The familiar voice continues. Rostin introduces himself, noting their hardship in looking for him since they did know his name. Ludi recognizes him as the princess's distressed escort from before. Rostin apologizes for how the guards inconvenienced him. Rostin introduces Ludi to the waiting princess. Irina displays a prestigious gown. Ludi recounts the time he saw her on the battlefield. Other women can't compete with her beauty. Ludi shows his respect to the princess. Her footsteps approach him. Instantly, she asks him how he healed her. Ludi expects her question. He carefully thinks about his response. With many options, he is left with outwitting her. Ludi answers by using purges. He explains that it is a magic from his village that can remove poison. Yurina agrees with its effects. Happily, the princess hears his answer as expected. Ludi displays a puzzled look. She recounts using an antidote and dispel on her wound, but both were ineffective. Confidently, Yurina believes in the purge magic, thinking it is high tier. Silently, Ludi notes that it is wise not to lie about magic. Despite his bad made-up story, he thinks she will not notice. Yurina summoned him to express her gratitude and more. She asks too many questions, putting Ludi in a dilemma. Yurina plans to visit his village. Ludi feels trapped, thinking that the villagers will find her visit disturbing. Ludi tries to make up multiple excuses until he says he burned the grimoire containing the spell. The princess turns annoyed and disappointed. Silently, he anticipates her giving up. Instead, the princess asks him to teach her the purge magic. Ludi politely refuses while he notes his low status, but Yurina could not care less and ordered him to teach her. Silence echoes through the room. 
Ludi asks why a royal figure like her wants to learn regeneration magic. She apologizes for the lack of context. Yurina takes off her glove, rendering Ludi speechless. He expresses his disbelief. Yurina shows him her emperor's seal. Still bewildered, Ludi notes they have the same mark. The royal family is granted by God the seal to form packs with servants and grant magic. Ludi is fixated on her emperor's seal with five points. Yurina confirms it is similar to the holy emperor's. Ludi realizes that she is a descendant of the empire's nobles. However, she can't use the seal, so it is useless for her. His brothers effortlessly formed packs with servants, but she could not. That is why she studied magic to find a solution. But she does not know that her five-pointed seal can only work on monsters. Ludi can't tell her this, as he is afraid she would share his grisly fate. Wallowed in self-pity, she is determined to be useful with a purge. Ludi understands her feelings. He calls her, but Yurina interrupts by offering him money to be her servant. The room falls into silence. Ludi looks awkward, noting he can earn her payment in a day. Naively, she asks Rostin how much adventurers get paid. No matter what, Ludi will avoid becoming a servant to keep his freedom. Suddenly, Ludi gazes at her notebook. He wonders about the seal's disappearance. He suggests giving up in order to form packs because of her seal. If she is not part of the royal family, the seal should not bother her. Yurina objects to his opinions. She accepts her fate and finds the God-sent seal meaningful. Besides, she wants to keep the seal because it resembles the holy emperors, revealing her desire to be like him in the future. Ludi pauses, then chuckles, causing Yurina to feel embarrassed. While she explains herself, Ludi agrees to be her servant for a very cheap price. But instead of a servant, he will be her mentor. Until the princess learns to purge, Yurina and Rostin display their happiness. Ludi looks forward to their collaboration. He finds her strong-willed and without bad intentions. However, Ludi still needs extra income for his servants. At the inn, Marina wants to become an adventurer. She explains that she is getting bored and wants to help Ludi. But Rune objects as she is not ready and will only cause trouble instead. Marina insists, but her lack of common sense and human interaction will be a problem. Ludi asks Room to take it easy. He asks Marina to join her to collect herbs and test her abilities at fighting monsters. Marina's face lights up. She joins her master and Room in a quest. Ludi teaches her about medicinals and poisonous herbs. The herb with smaller leaves is medicinal, while the opposite contains poison. He gives Marina a test, but she fails to identify the poisonous herb. Ludi is patient about training her despite Rune's objections. While failure is inevitable, what matters is their courage to confront the challenges. He gently reminds Rune of her past failures for perspective. While Marina closely observes the grass, a vine slowly wraps around her leg. Violently, the vine lifts her upside down. Eurus is alerted. Rafflesia binds Marina's body as the wild plant is about to eat her. Ludi reassures Marina of her safety. Unexpectedly, Marina seems to have fun with her situation. Ludi and Rune pause in bewilderment. He finds her optimism amusing. Rune uses a fireball to burn the vine while keeping the flower intact so they can sell in the market. A fiery ball of magic is conjured by Rune. Marina is untangled from the wild plant. Rune gives her an earful about being cautious. Ludi mediates them and notes his carelessness. Suddenly, he discovers a magic ore's essence in the scene. Without the strike, they would not find it. Ludi thanks Marina's efforts. Her accidental contribution led them to a fortune. Rune remains silent. While Marina displays a grateful attitude, strictly Rune reminds her not to be a burden and to study magic upon returning home. Marina picks up the ore's essence from the ground. Ludi decides to train her combat abilities. Reluctantly, Rune interrupts, noting that her combat skills are enough. Ludi notices her strange reaction. Shyly, Rune asks Ludi who he likes more between her and Marina. Ludi is caught off guard. He feels strange about Rune's insubordination. He observes that she is not in a good mood. Although he noted that failure is inevitable, Ludi admits that his decisions were not always right. If he fails, then he will just improve next time. But he worries about another wave of hatred and grudges. If it happens, he does not know how to make up for it. Meanwhile, danger befalls a camping civilian. A wild beast's growl echoes through the forest, causing the man to panic. Shrouded in smoke, a wild wolf reveals its fearsome form. The wolf notes a familiar scent. Adventurers talk about a mysterious black shadow. Rumor has it that a dashing shadow with glowing red eyes attacks civilians at night. Ludi listens in. He observes that Noor is in a better state. She was distressed after the goblin's raid. Ludi is caught watching Noor. Despite the rumors, there are no casualties and details remain vague. But the rumors impacted negatively, causing the decline of merchants to travel to their city. That is why a quest is posted for the Black Shadow's hunt. Ludi is surprised by the hefty reward money. 
With this, Ludi can buy many items. Ludi and Rune show interest. Given their growing need for food and shelter, they need enough money for sustenance. Excitement fills Ludi and Rune's faces. However, depression fills the air with a drunken Rune. Ludi comforts her. Apparently, only gold-ranked and above adventurers can take on the quest, disqualifying them. But it is valid to restrict the quest to higher ranks as the quest is riskier. He believes that Nor's group with the highest rank of adventurers should finish the quest by now. The target must be a middle-tier magic user who can conceal its presence. The mood shifts to optimism. Ludi smiles and asks Rune if she is worried about Nor's party. She panics and notes that she only cares about her master. Silently, he worries about the target. The mysterious shadow's agenda remains vague for Ludi. Until he decides on something, Ludi joins the quest and asks for his other servants. Rune supports him. Despite their ineligibility for a reward, he is more interested in grasping the situation. Eris and her party have searched the whole city, but to no avail. The party argues and goes for another round of scouting. Ludi expands the area of his search, learning from Eris' group. He follows the main road to the north. Ludi orders Rune to stop camouflaging. While walking, Ludi senses something strange. Ominously, he asks the air to reveal its true form since no one is around, surprise soaked in Ludi's face. Avil, the wolf, greets Rune. He followed Rune's scent and condemned her for living with humans. The many years that have passed have caught up to them. A revelation awaits to be shared with Avil. Rune reveals that Ludi reincarnated into a new form beside her. Avil's astonishment displays. Ludi explains his situation himself. He is apologetic about his actions a thousand years ago and displays remorse, noting his betrayal of their loyalty as servants. While he does not expect forgiveness, he wishes Avil happiness instead. But the wolf responds with an outburst of rage as he charges his old master. Rune protects Lupis. She blocks Avil's attack with a magic barrier. She is enraged by his disrespect for her master. Avil calls Rune crazy. Angrily, the beast does not believe Rune. Recounting his master's death at the hands of humans, Despite bearing resemblance to his master, he can't believe Rune's claims. Avil forgets their past relationship and threatens to harm them. Rune asks Ludi to cast a reminiscent spell for Avil to remember him. Despite sending his memories to Avil, the beast will not stop. The wolf's mouth is wide open before Ludi. Swiftly, he dodges Avil's violent attempt, which almost kills him. Their fight reminds him of their first encounter. He notes that Avil is not surprised at all, but the wolf's anger intensifies as Ludi utters his name. He is startled by an upcoming attack. His magic barrier will not make it. Just in time, Ludi blocks the attack with his water dragon spell. He is impressed by Avil's usage of middle tier magic. The beast's anger echoes in the forest. Ludi witnesses Avil's reluctance, noting his impersonation of his master. The beast has already forgotten his old master, and he can't be swayed. Ludi has already died once, and Avil plans to do it again. Rune tries to stop his former companion. Unexpectedly, Ludi pushes Rune away to protect her from Avil's impending attack. He happily accepts the beast's violent strike. The wolf is over Ludi's defenseless body. Avil's eyes look docile as he changes his mind. Ludi comforts Avil for his hardships. The two reunited with a hug as Avil's tears shed. With his seal, Ludi formally accepts Avil as his servant again. The wolf displays his respect for his master. Rune gives him an earful after his rudeness to Ludi. Her annoyance displays itself while Ludi calms her down. Avil reassures her that he will not take her place as a maid. Rune is finally pacified. Avil did not expect to meet his old master, as he was about to migrate. Humans have accommodated Avil's place, so he moved out to avoid conflict. That said, Avil honored Ludi's dying wish not to harm any humans. Ludi acknowledges his hardships. Once again, Avil apologizes for his rudeness. Ludi is happy to see him alive and active. Rune informs Avil that their master took servants under his roof. All the more, he needs to find a bigger place. Luckily, Avil knows an ideal place. Ludi also has some prospects. Rune is still bothered by Avil's comments earlier. Meanwhile, his other servants, like Vandal the Orc, passed away due to old age. Avil was also Arlong many years ago, but due to his immortality as a vampire, he should be fine. It is heartbreaking for Ludi that he could not reunite with Vandal. Avil asks if he knows where Gilas the Cyclops is. Ludi has no idea. But Avil suggests finding him as he keeps his master's sword. Ludi remembers and notes that he passed his sword to Avil. Recently, he reports that chaos between humans and monsters has rapidly increased. Avil suggests taking extra precautions. When Ludi was an emperor, he had a special sword. He used ores to forge magical weapons, and their size is proportionate to their power. But with magic, his weapon was lightweight yet powerful. While his sword will boost his power, he does not need it now. 
but recounting the goblin's raid that heralds dark times, he might need his sword after all. In the palace, Irina wants to search for Ludi's sword as well. While Ludi himself pours her tea, he pretends not to know about the sword. Irina expresses her great interest in the weapon. Legend has it that the Holy Emperor was a sword master, and his weapon holds remarkable value. Ludi is astonished. He thinks her information about his swordsmanship is mistaken, but Irina is certain of it. Silently, he denies this information and his swordsmanship stinks. History says that the Emperor killed thousands and was the strongest sword master. Irina looks charmed, while Ludi is embarrassed. He thinks that his legend is too far-fetched. Ludi asks her why she wants the sword. Her main reason is magic power, so she can use high-tier spells. Silently, he notes that Irina learns complex magic quickly. With enough magic power, high-tier magic should be no problem. Irina looks down, while Ludi looks worried. Her exhaustion is evident. Despite her hard work, magic power does not increase easily. Ludi clarifies if the sword is really in their country, but she passionately believes in a legend. Irina presents extensive research about a thousand-year-old legend. Ludi is astonished by her knowledge. Villagers did not provide reliable information, so she started asking adventurers. Proudly, she left a quest at the guild to find the sword in return for a huge reward worth 30 del. The adventurers are perplexed by the small reward money for the quest. Ludi is astonished by his interest in his legendary sword. Eris and Castle contemplate taking on the princess's quest, but it is a typical reaction to a thousand-year-old myth. He notes that only he and Yurina believe the legend. However, another believer supports the sword's existence. Nor also states the same information that Yurina shared with Ludi. Nor confirms that the legendary sword is an Elpen. Ludi awkwardly sees another supporter. Eris and Castle pass on the low-budget quest, while Ludi falls silent. In the forest, Ludi and Rune enjoy fine weather. Ludi ended up searching for the sword so that he could see Gila's. Rune joyfully asks him if Gila's would be pleased to see her in a revealing dress. She worries if Gila's attacks them aggressively. But Ludi is confident that Gila's will not resort to brute force like Avil. He recounts his time at the Magic Academy. When his peers attempted a strike, Ludi stopped them. His peers attacked Gila's to scare him. He noted that the Cyclops did not resist. He ordered them to maintain their position until their return. He asked Gila's for his lack of resistance. His closed hand opened with two rabbits, astonishing Ludi. Gila's noted that they were his friends. Ludi smiles, finding him unbelievable. Gila's is the most gentle among his servants, which is why he gave his sword to him. But Rune is unreasonably angry for some reason. They arrive at an entrance locked by boulders. Suddenly, a roaming rat blows up, and the skeleton of a cyclops displays. Following his memories, Ludi notes that Gila's only ate fruits, but with his size, they were not enough for him. But he insisted on not harming other living things, so Ludi chose him as his servant. Ludi genuinely appreciates Gila's gentleness. They stand before the ruins that Eris mentioned. It is an ideal place for Gila's to hide his sword. Ludi uses his presence detection for good measure. He senses a familiar human presence, nor is there anything inside the ruin. While she knows a lot of the Emperor's tale, it is not good if she finds the hideout. Immediately, he asks Rune to use camouflage to hide him. She gives her master a warm hug. He feels awkward while wondering if it is necessary for Rune to hug her intimately. Inside the dark cave, he thinks that Nor forms her own party for the quest. Suddenly, he sees the remnants of the explosion. While he confirms it is Nor's work, he wonders about the position of the boulder. Ludi hides while footsteps approach. Frightened screams echo from the cave. Adventurers run in fear from a monstrous presence. Anxiously, Ludi notes about Nor getting left behind. Rune stops her camouflage and lights up the dark cave. Ludi senses Nor's presence, indicating that she is still alive. Urgently, Ludi and Rune run toward her. They witness Nor lying on the ground. Immediately, Ludi checks on her, who is unconscious. He is relieved to know she just fainted. Urgently, he orders Rune to get Nor out of the cave. Unexpectedly, a massive club violently hits the ground. Annoyed, he gets a glimpse of the monster wreaking havoc. Bewilderment fills his face as he clarifies if the Cyclops are Gila's. The monster continues to show his immense strength against Ludi. The Cyclops ignore him, but he recognizes the club that he gave Gila's. Rune lights the fire for Ludi. He tries to calm down his old servant. A Cyclops's towering skeleton is displayed before him. Ludi is perplexed to see the skeleton holding Gila's cudgel. He speculates that Gila's used immortalization for himself. The monster's soulless eye gazes at him. He asks why, but he already knows the answer. Due to Gilazi's undying loyalty to Ludi, he dies protecting his legendary sword. His horrified eyes display as he blames himself. 
Because of his order, Jilas becomes undead. Rune's frightened scream echoes the cave while she is pinned to the ground. Ludi is anxious while Rune slowly melts back to her slimy form. Annoyed, Rune shoots his slimy form at Jilas and covers his eye. The monster is distracted. Rune tells Ludi to calm down. They need to put Jilas down since he is already zombified. Ludi is in a pickle while Rune pressures him to answer. Light emanates from Jilas's skeletal figure. His form slowly perishes from Ludi's divine light. Only Jilas's eyeball remains, rolling on the ground. Ludi expresses his devastation. He recounts when Jilas buried his bunny friends. Worried, Ludi asked if Jilas was okay. At this moment, the Cyclops pledged to serve Ludi. His grieving voice echoes the cave upon his gentle servant's death. Ludi sacrificed his life so that his servants could survive, but he never considered those who could not accept his decision. He wonders how Jilas felt when he died in solitude in the darkness. Nor rouses her peers' worried voices. Nor's party called for reinforcements, so Eris and Castle arrive. She recounts being attacked by a skeleton and urgently looking for Ludi's sword. Eris carries the sword Nor took with her. The legendary weapon looks normal to her. Eris takes Nor back to the city to recover. The ruin's entrance is covered again with boulders. The adventurers left without suspecting that the sword was fake. The entrance to the ruins has been blocked. Rune is worried about his master. Ludi sits in silence as he grieves for his fallen servant. He thinks he was wrong after all. He never considered his servant's feelings, thinking they would probably choose to die with him. Rune finally knows what his master thinks about it. Ludi thinks he needs to adjust his life. At first, he sought freedom, but now he wants to know how his servants live. Ludi wants to ensure they are doing fine with his own eyes. Rune passionately supports her master and vows to crush any objections. Once things calm down, he plans to move. Ludi vows this before Jilazi's grave. Ludi delivers the legendary sword to Princess Yurina. He stored a large amount of mana in the sword to channel to its user. His old sword was guarded by his old servant, and he made himself immortal to protect it, so he can't simply give it to Yurina. Ludi gives her a fake sword instead. Although he copied his old sword's mana accumulating property from the fake one, but Yurina finds the sword too fancy for the Emperor to use. Ludi recommends that she use a spell to test. Yurina tries to cleanse a cursed poison. Astonishment fills her face after she casts a spell with the sword. Yurina is pleased by her success. The cleansing was flawless, indicating that she only lacked mana. Her talent and hard work finally paid off. Ludi trusts her not to misuse the fake sword, thinking his decision is right. He bids farewell to the princess after fulfilling his role. Yurina's eyes look upset. She expresses her gratitude for Ludi's help. The princess pauses momentarily. She notes that his reservation will not make him lucky with girls. Ludi is rendered speechless. She blushes while saying she does not hate it about him. Ludi feels awkward. After making the joke, she gives him her reward, but she waits for the time when he becomes more forward. Afterwards, girls greet Ludi's return to his apartment. The slimes camouflage into humans as part of their training. He notes that they have learned how to transform, but Rune shuts them up aggressively. She gives them an earful for showing off. Suddenly, darkness fills the room. The slime is perplexed. A dark mist forms inside the room. Avil announces his return from his mission. Ludi is pleased with his quick return. The slimes express their bewilderment to Avil. Ludi asks him if he has found a good place for them. About half a day away from Vel's speed, there is a suitable place for them. For a human, it is four days of travel time. Avil offers to take Ludi to the place he discovered. Rune tries to manage the chaos, so Ludi does not worry. At night, Avil dashes with Ludi. The wolf notices Ludi's legendary sword. He asks about Jilas, but his master falls silent. Sadness fills his eyes as Ludi decides to fill him in. Avil is perplexed by the lengths that Jilas took. Ludi vocally blames himself for his past life. He thought he was protecting his servants, but he overlooked their pain. Avil tries to comfort him. If anything, his servants were responsible for leaving the sword to Jilas. Ludi wonders and promises not to leave Avil alone. The wolf notes that it is the least of his master's worries. Avil promises to follow him wherever he goes. Jokingly, Ludi thinks it is scary. He takes a nap on his back until they arrive. The wolf travels through the depths of night. Ludi peacefully sleeps on his servant's back. They arrive at an isolated location by the river. Ludi likes a place surrounded by everything they need. Avil thinks that Ludi wonders how this place remains untouched. His master confirms that he is thinking the same thing. Avil notes that the western part of the continent has many uncultivated lands. Immersed in his thoughts, he notes the reason behind the unexplored land. Avil steps as he announces their emperor. A pack of wolves lay before them. Avil introduces them and swears their loyalty to him, their emperor. Avil wishes he had gathered a bigger pack for Ludi. 
but 18 hellhounds are equivalent to over 100 humans. Hellhounds do not usually form packs and get attached to humans. If they want to serve him, the pack must trust Avil. Ludi introduces himself and reaches for his hand. A wolf's footstep begins to move. Ludi called Luz and the other goblins to help them prepare and gather food. Avil asks, once he has set up the base, what Luby's next action plan is. For now, he plans to travel the world and find his old servants. Avil is relieved to hear his plans. Ludi promises not to act like an emperor again and avoids war and politics. Avil agrees with his decision, expressing his disappointment with humans. Talks like this make Ludi realize Avil is still a monster. Something suddenly strikes Ludi's attention. He stops Avil for a second. He gazes at a nearby village. Ludi feels strange about it. He plans to look around and asks Avil to cast an invisibility spell. Avil conceals his presence while Ludi investigates. Bewilderment displays his face. Cloaked men gather helpless bodies at the center of the village. Ludi is perplexed to see the villagers. He notes that they are still breathing and wonders what happened. Violently, the cloaked man grabs a helpless woman. Her neck was slit by a sharp knife. Urgently, Ludi calls Avil, while the wolf instantly obeys. The cloaked men turned their heads back. Anxiously, Ludi thinks they noticed him. He wonders if they can use Detect. A violent wind blows in Ludi and Al's presence. Suddenly, they use mid-tier magic against him, baffling Ludi. Fangs display the cloaked man's mouth. The vampires recognize the intruder's presence. The frightening creatures order Ludi and Avil to reveal themselves.